Great. Yeah, so one of my favorite examples to cite because they're quite well known for their ineptitude in resolving customer issues well um, is the interactions that you see with United Airlines. So there was recently the awful situation where a gentleman, a doctor, was removed forcibly from his seat in an airline's jet and was actually, his nose was broken. He actually had to be admitted into hospital, um, which is just extraordinary at the best of times. You wouldn't expect it. And what was interesting was that in the conversation that ensued, when people tweeted to United Airlines, they said, look, what on earth is happening? The airline apologized, but they, they apologized for the overbooked situation and not for the damage, physical, emotional, and psychological that they inflicted on this guy, on this doctor who had paid for his seat. So I think when you look at the extraordinary capacity of some companies to misjudge what the issue is and why people are complaining, it goes to show that it's actually, even though it should come naturally, um, a lot of people in customer service roles have a lot to learn. Or the companies making the decisions as to what they're allowed to respond actually need to really up their game. Um, so empathy, unfortunately, is not necessarily the norm when it comes to customer service issues. Yeah. Yeah. Internationally. <laughs> oh, that's such a good one. Well, so here's the thing. If you're asking people who, many of whom, we're talking about the customers here, many of whom can't afford to own their own homes and are upset and outraged because they're being asked to part with money that they don't have to, f to pay for someone else's mortgage, then I would suggest that instead of just virtue signaling and saying, well, we care about our customers, when you've made such a big mistake like that, maybe you need to act on a larger scale that uh, shows people what your values are. So then maybe it might be, okay, first of all, we explicitly and unreservedly apologize for this. This is a misjudgment. We were intending to support our hosts because we work closely with them, but we understand that actually a lot of our end users, our clients are in a tough spot. We're going to donate to this charity that helps people um, get their foot on the ladder, for instance, uh, and get into the property housing market. So that there comes a point at which just giving it all of this and creating a fancy campaign is so um, flimsy that people can see right through it. And then you really have to step up and walk the talk. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, okay. So one of them is the, it depends on what stage of the lockdown in various countries you want to talk about. Um, the first most obvious one that I saw was that there was a first week of panic. And this is, you can kind of track this by country. So I'm living in Spain. There was a week of panic before people knew what was going to happen. And then suddenly loads of businesses, it's like they all got a memo. And at the same time, everyone's email inbox was flooded by businesses, maybe one that you interacted with once five years ago, sending you a message saying, oh, well, we're protecting our staff, we're protecting you. And it's not relevant to the customer. There's no, well, what's in it for me? I don't care what you're doing um, because I'm dealing with having kids at home or whatever it might be, not being at business. So that's, that's the key thing. It's, okay, put yourself in the position of the customer. Do they need this information from you at this time? Or is it self-serving? Um, another one is to make sure that you understand what emotional and practical intervention you can actually provide to customers. So it's not just about having a nice message that looks good. It really has to do good. And I think one of the biggest trends that we saw, especially in the most recent months, is that people's values are becoming more prioritized in terms of which brands they buy from, which brands they won't buy from again because they were firing employees or uh, maybe taking missteps during the pandemic that they shouldn't, in, for instance, forcing people back to work. So I would say, yeah, being customer-centric, understanding what's in it for the customer if you reach out to them, 
um, and being more aligned with values. What is it that you can actually do emotionally and practically to help support your customers? Where does that align? Yeah. <laughs> Well, as an end user, I'll speak from that perspective as well as with my psychology hat on. I think um, one of the things that you see online is that when you are anonymous, it allows you to be a little bit more disinhibited. Um, so often we can open up a little bit more and be more clear about what we feel, be more clear in our language use and about what the problem is. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is that you're not having the chance to read facial expressions. So there is almost like a, there's a kind of a, a turning down of the volume of emotion that happens. So if you're reading text because you're working in that language modality instead of face to face, you actually have to slow down and read what's happening. So it also kind of forces you to be more um, thoughtful and deliberate in what you read, what you write. So that also creates a different sort of type of decision making. So I think for those reasons, it can be quite helpful um, as long as the client feels that progress is being made to switch to a live chat situation. Also, it's, you know, it's, it's a modality we're used to. It's instant, it's quick, it's convenient. Um, and it often means that we get service much more rapidly than staying on the line for a phone or video call. Mm. Also, I guess if you're trying to build rapport, especially when um, it's a brand that maybe you're less familiar with, then I think video plays a great part in creating that sense of connection. So often, if I've got a new client that I'm working with and delivering something for, um, I will want to jump on a video call so that we can have some version of eye contact, some version of gestural uh, rapport, because that's really important. So when you're trying to build connection, the visual interaction can be very useful in creating a quick emotional bond that is perhaps slower to form through text exchanges. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Top tips, okay, number one, super simple, often gets lost. Make sure that you have a single visible call to action on the page. Um, if you've got a call to action, which is the top, make sure it's visible against the background. A lot of people are using video uh, and the text sometimes blurs out. So that's really important. Um, if you're using beautiful images, which most of us now hopefully do, and you are using faces and figures, so people um, who are gesturing, simple trick is to have them gesturing towards the call to action, having them looking towards it. Um, the other thing is language use. If you are using Google ads or Instagram ads and people are clicking through, make sure that the language is consistent. And this is specifically important if you're doing personalized targeting through, you know, personality based words. So, I mean, this is a whole other conversation, but if you're doing personality based targeting, and you're someone who is high in extroversion, you're gonna respond better to words such as exciting and adventurous. So if I see an ad on Instagram that knows that I'm a little bit more skewed towards extroversion, if you're using that language in the ad, make sure that that then is coherent with the landing page that you're moving towards. Um, I mean, there's loads of things. I hope that's just some techniques that you can use, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so there has been research around the use of emojis for more nuanced emotional interactions. They do seem to inject more of a sense of emotional context and communication. So it enriches the language. Um, and then obviously, you know, you're seeing me in a screen. I like to use my hands a lot. I actually, when I'm on stage, I physically move quite a lot. I'm quite active. So I think what you miss when you're having a video chat is all of the other expressions of expansion, of closure um, that you, you would otherwise get if you're physically in front of someone. So I think one trick, I'm gonna do this now, hopefully you can see it. If I move this back and I move myself back and you can see a little bit more of my hands, suddenly it becomes much more expressive. But of course, this is easier because then you can see my expressions better. So it depends on where you want the attention to be. 
um, but it does make a difference. I think also what's what some of the research I've found is that if you have like a meeting, a Zoom meeting um, that's being led by someone who's less expressive, people's attention tends to fragment um, and dissolve much more quickly. So we still, we still respond to emotional expressivity, even within the confines of a screen where you can see maybe a bit of hand and the head. So it is important still in video chat to be expressive, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So on a cell phone, obviously, you have a lot less visual real estate to play with. So minimizing the actions to the, the core functions that you want people to pursue is going to be really important. Um, one of the nice things, if you could find a way to reduce the cognitive load or mental effort, so it's basically making the friction as low as possible to get from the image that you see to the buying page for that particular product. Uh, a great example here, actually on Instagram, I was looking at this for another uh, workshop that I'm doing. If you look at Jimmy Choo and you see their, their page, Instagram has made it super easy for you to post the image, tap on the product, go through. And in order to make use of the system that's already optimized to minimize um, cognitive load, you have to make sure that when you scroll through, the image of the product is consistent because it means that the brain's familiarized and you can make the process go much more quickly rather than have one image of the shoe and then a different angle of the shoe and a third angle of the shoe, for instance. So it's kind of working with the brain's heuristics or cognitive shortcuts to make the feeling of ease much more present. Um, the same is true of using fonts with no squirrely bits. So like making it sans serif, high contrast, easy to read. The more simple the interaction is, the greater the sense of fluency and the easier someone will complete an action that you want them to engage in. Yeah. Yeah, and especially if you're in a, if you're in a platform like Instagram or, well, yeah, most Instagram or Pinterest, you're there because you wanna be entertained mostly. So you want something that's going to feel fluid. You don't want that experience to be interrupted. Um, so that's why it's especially important and every single point of friction counts. Yes, exactly. It can't be choppy. Mm. That's interesting. Well, a couple of tips. Um, one thing that I would suggest is doing some research, first of all, on what the most frequently asked questions are and whether people bounce off that page quickly because they can't find what they're looking for. What I have found is that, well, a sort of a simple intervention, we were talking about live chat earlier. If you have an FAQ page and people can't find what they're looking for, having a live chat box that pops up gives people the freedom to just quickly interact with someone who can then help them with that specific query. So I think often the wording can be different. As we've seen in the mirroring, the way that we word a phrase or a question can vary quite a lot from one individual to the next. And if you don't get the wording right, it can be hard to find the question that most relates to your issue. So there has to be some flexibility around how people arrive at the answer. So I think a live chat function in that instance is probably really good. And then ongoing research to make sure that your top FAQs are indeed what people are searching for. Yeah. No, I would suggest that, you know, they're a good place to start, but the number of times where I just go onto an FAQ page and what I'm trying to find just isn't there. Um, and it's a really obvious thing for the user, but maybe they haven't tested it out. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> mm. Mm. So one of the things that um, I thought was really interesting in terms of adoptions of new behaviors in the last few months is that a lot more people, including in um, the senior citizen category, so maybe 65 and up, are becoming more familiarized with video calls because often that's the only way that we get to socialize. So one of the things that's interesting, if we're gonna find ways to communicate with people who are not digital natives, is instead of text, which is actually very laborious if you're having to train yourself to type and you've never typed on a laptop, um, or to read text, which is very small. You know, you've got to think about different visual capacities and abilities. 
Video is going to be one of the simplest, most intuitive ways that you can enable richer communication. It's emotionally more resonant. It visually, it's easier to understand if you have the gestures and the expression and the sound. Uh, and so one of the changes that I saw was a shift from call centers to video call centers with a lot more older people actually making that switch through necessity. So I think that's one of the biggest things that we've seen um, and that is likely to be a lasting behavioral change because it's so much richer than just a voice on the phone. Although sometimes it can be nice just to have a voice on the phone. There is, you know, variety there as well. I don't know, actually, on that one. I haven't, I think it depends on, it generally depends on what's the easiest action. And it depends on how much the person has habituated to, in these times, a video function, uh, and also what the site's optimized for. So if, for instance, and I know this has happened in people, with people that I know, if you gift an elderly relative an iPad because that's the only way they can stay in touch with family members, then a website is gonna look different on an iPad than it is on a desktop or whatever. And it may be that it's much easier to hit a button and just call through video than it is to find the number, copy the number, paste it through. So it depends on the individual's context, the, you know, the, the um, laptop or device that they're using um, and what they've become habituated to. So that one's a bit more individually variable. <laughs> yeah and there's so much variety I mean, by sort of like learning these principles allows you to adapt more easily to the, to the different situations because really we are extremely varied but there are certain principles that can help you deal with that variety in a more um, nuanced way uh oh <laughs> Oh God, right, I will give you my worst. Um, <laughs> therapy time, no, I'm joking. So um, here in Barcelona, I moved into a flat last year and we had to change the gas and electricity meters because they'd, they'd somehow got it mixed up with the neighbors and they were somehow using loads and loads of electricity. And we got a huge bill one month, which we just, it was no reason for it to be that big. And it's been, it's, it's been a year and a month since we've been engaging with these two different companies trying to get them to reverse the charge uh, and they still haven't fixed it. A year and a month, 17 months, yeah. So, uh, but there comes a point at which you kind of just have to, um, I guess not take it too seriously, but that's a pretty big faux pas. But here, it also there's a cultural difference. Here people, as far as I can tell, the people that we spoke to, don't expect changes to happen rapidly and the customer service is generally quite variable. So, um, yeah you've got to factor in with any of these questions the cultural context of the the place that you're you're looking at the companies the place of the, yeah. <laughs> of the business <laughs> no well we did from one of the companies but nothing's happened so there's only a certain point you know you can say sorry over 13 months and if nothing changes how sorry are they really <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah pleasure My pleasure, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure, thanks. <laughs>